Hi everyone, my name is Luke Fernandez and I'm this year's VIP Distinguished Speaker Series Chair. Now the VIP Distinguished Speaker Series is an event brought to you by the Undergraduate Business Council of the Red McComb School for Business. Today we have Dean Eric Hurst, Dean of the MBA program here at the Red McComb School for Business, interviewing George Bodenheimer, CEO and President of ESPN and ABC Sports. Now the event will begin with a Q&A between Dean Hurst and Mr. Bodenheimer, and then we will open up the floor for questions from the audience. As a reminder, today's event ends promptly at 6.30 p.m., and we would greatly appreciate it if you could refrain from leaving early. Now, would you please join me in giving a warm welcome to the UT Head of Athletics Department, DeLos Dodds, as he introduces tonight's esteemed guests. Thank you. All Longhorns in here? Huh? Yeah, I like that. I like that. No Aggies? We've, we've been busy helping the Aggies. We've, we've been over there helping them pack. And then we've been busy helping them unpack. Uh, you know, we don't like them on game day, but they are Texans and we love Texans. And whatever they do, we wish them well. Well, thanks for being here, and thank you, Luke. Um, this is a special day for us um, because our guest is George Bodenheimer, the president of ABC ESPN Sports, a really, really top-notch guy. He's uh, the company's longest tenured top executive. He's led ESPN and ABC Sports through unprecedented periods of growth. Now, he's been at ESPN for 30 years, and I've been at Texas 30 years. He started in January, I started in August. I have not had one promotion in those 30 years. <laughs> and look at George. Uh, if you're sitting in the audience like you are in most of your students, uh, I'd listen to two things, two areas that George will talk about, and I would listen closely. I'd listen to him tell the story about how he got started at ESPN and how he navigated his career through all of those 30 years. I'd also listen closely to the remarks on how he manages his company and how he works with 7,000 employees. Pretty special guy. He's a master, in my mind, in those two areas. And I think he can help you build a roadmap to make your careers successful. His first job after graduating from Denison University, one of the football powers on the East Coast, was driving, driving for the mail room. It's a huge start. I think Dick Vitale still calls you his chauffeur. He did chauffeur Dick Vitale around. Over his 30 years, he's worn every pair of shoes you can wear. He knows every job at ESPN. He remembers how he was treated by supervisors and how he wanted to be treated by them. And over those 30 years, he's grown into his own business philosophy. And what I know and like about George is that he, he, he empowers people, he empowers his staff, and he operates in a culture of family. We've had the privilege of working with ESPN on our campus with the Longhorn Network. 60, 70 of the best people on earth. We love the relationship we have with them. We're totally impressed with them. And what a great marriage between ESPN and the University of Texas. And you need to write your number down for Time Warner and you need to call in Time Warner and get them started on this network. Uh, thank you for being here. Uh, I'm excited to hear what George and Dean Hurst are going to say. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, George Bodenheimer. Well, George, thank you very much for coming. It's, it's a pleasure to have you here. I'm really looking forward to hearing more about, about your past, about the future, about future of the Longhorn Network, ESPN, and so on. DeLoss referred to this. You referred to your first job. I wonder, you know, we've got a large group of students here wondering where they will be in the future. I suspect there's more than a few of them who would like your job. 
Now, I think it's reasonably safe from this group for now, right. but down the road, they might like to know something about how you got started. What, what was your first job I mean, before ESPN, at ESPN, and so on? Well, uh, first off, uh, Delos, thank you for the kind introduction, and it's really, uh, really a pleasure uh, to be here uh, today. It's a little bit like old home week for me. I did work at uh, ESPN, had an office uh, up in Dallas about 30 years ago, and I used to work there, was traveling, traveled throughout the state, and have fond memories of traveling out throughout Texas and being in Austin a number of times. So it's it's uh, it's great to be great to be back. And thank you for the for the warm welcome. Uh, as far as uh, jobs concerned, I I you know had a lot of jobs uh, pumping gas, caddying, uh, bus boy, bartender, you know all that kind of stuff. I uh, graduated as uh, the loss mentioned from the football power Denison University, yeah. and uh, I wanted I thought I wanted to work in baseball, so I wrote uh, 28 letters. It was 28 teams then. I wrote letter that basically said, you need me in your front office. And I got back 27 we don't think so's. <laughs> and uh, I got one interview out of that, out of 28 letters. And uh, so I drove down to Philadelphia, the Phillies. Uh, he was a Denison man, so that's why I got the interview. And uh, he gave me a tie, no job. He gave me a Phillies tie and <laughs> said I should look at the minor leagues if I wanted to get into baseball. Yeah. So it didn't sound that enthusiastic to me. So I then tried the arenas like Madison Square Garden and Boston Garden, you know, up around where I lived. Couldn't even get an interview. Really wasn't very successful there. And finally, a friend of my father's uh, who was in the television business said, well, gee, if you want to get into television, you should get into cable. Now, this was 1980 uh, when the broadcast networks were certainly, you know, kings of the hill and cable was this kind of next to nothing business. And he said, I know some people at ESPN. I could get you in to see the human resources director. So I said, that sounded fine. I was interested in sports with the baseball and the arena thing. I didn't really have an interest in television, per se. But I was looking for a job. So I went up to Bristol. And um, I'm pretty certain that the uh, human resources director didn't actually look up at me during my interview. Uh, <laughs> it didn't last very long, uh, maybe a minute or two. Um, he looked at my resume and said that I'd be qualified to be a driver in the mailroom and that they might have an opening in a week or so and was I interested. And I said, sure. And he said, well, we'll, we'll call you for, if we have something. So I, I lived about 60 miles from Bristol and I remember driving home thinking, you know, what am I going to tell my dad? Uh, you know, he was been, he's been involved in my, you know, trying to find a job and career and everything. And I got home and, uh, I described to my father what uh, the day had been like, and he suggested that we go out for a beer and talk it over. And we did. We went out, and I described to him what it, the day had been like, and that they had perhaps uh, they'd offered me a job, sort of. But the job only was uh, it paid less than one year of tuition of the college that I just graduated from. We had a number of student loans and. Uh, you know, to put it in perspective, in those days you could get an entry-level position as a salesman or some sort for, you know, IBM or International Paper or those kind of companies that recruited in the Midwest, and you could make $30,000 a year was kind of the opening salary. And this salary at ESPN that I was sort of offered was 8000 So I really didn't know what to do. And uh, he gave me what I think is probably the best single piece of advice that I ever received. He said, if you think that sports television is a career that you would be interested in and they call you, you should absolutely accept the job because you're making a career decision, not a money decision. And uh, that made a lot of sense to me. And a week later, they called me. I accepted the job. And two days later, I was delivering the mail at ESPN. And uh, I've been there, been there ever since. And uh, I met so many uh, great people at ESPN. In fact, uh, my roommate from 30 years ago, uh, Mr. Colantonio, is sitting here in the front row. And uh, good to see you, Don. Don's working, down, been at ESPN all 30 of those years and is um, uh, working on the Longhorn Network, is down here, is one of the many of the 75 to 80 people we have who have, are on the staff at Longhorn. Roughly 40 of them have come down from our Bristol, Connecticut, including my, uh, my longtime friend Don Colantonio here. 
Um, but uh, my dad was right. You know, I, at 8,000 a year, I could find a roommate. I met Don. We, we split an apartment. I had enough money to, to get going, and uh, the money didn't matter at that point. So it was, a, it was some of the best advice I ever got, and that was really how I got started at ESPN. That's, that's terrific. That's a, that's a great story. What, what do you think about... It's not a story, of course. It's it's your life, right? When you think about yes, it's not fiction. It's a non-fiction. That's the truth. But it's the it's the it's the story that I think is sometimes people don't realize that one makes a choice early in one's career. You can go for money, you can go for passion, you can go for what you're interested in, and if and if you're interested and you work hard, oftentimes there's 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 terrific opportunities. When you when you think back to the mailroom. You think back to the, the, the group you started with, they're not all in the C-suite with you now. What would you say separated you from your peers and sort of, you know, from the mailroom on over the past 30 years? How does one go from, follow that path? And uh, you know, I think, uh, I think in a lot of respects I was very fortunate. I got with a company that uh, was growing rapidly. I mean, back in, uh, back in the early 80s at ESPN, if you had a pulse, you could get promoted. Um, it was a, a wildly growing company, and um, uh, but no, I, I think you got to work hard. I mean, you all are very fortunate. I mean, it's an understatement. You are students here at this wonderful, world-class university. Uh, you're going to have an opportunity to meet people. You have wonderful professors. You're going to have opportunities, and I really would encourage you to be thinking about the type of work you enter because boy, once you get that job, you gotta be excited about getting up every single day and coming to work and who you're gonna be working with. I would, just like my dad told me 31 years ago, I would put you know, money and perks way down on that list as you, as you leave here and start to develop your careers. Much more important what you're doing and who you're doing it with and the kind of company that you're doing it with is, is much more important. Uh, to um, to um, focus on. When I was uh, uh, shortly after the mailroom, I'll just give you an example of how uh, I was able to get started in my career. I was in the videotape library. It was my first promotion after the mailroom. I was working midnight to eight. If someone needed a videotape, they'd come in. It's much, much like a book library, but it's videotapes. They'd come in and you'd give them a videotape. Give me the 75 World Series. You go find it, give it to a producer. And uh, a job came open that happened to be in Texas, in, uh, in what I you know, said earlier before. Was, uh, we called it our Dallas office, even though it was in Arlington. Mm -hmm. And uh, it was in the sales department. Your job was to go throughout Texas, Arkansas, Oklahoma, Louisiana, and Mississippi and sell this crazy notion of a 24-hour sports network. Remember, it was uh, considered a a completely crazy idea back in 1980 and 81. And uh, much really enhancing my uh, opportunity to get that job, I was the only person in the company that applied for it. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, so they flew me to Texas. I went to the marketing department. I had some buddies. When you deliver the mail, you become friends with everybody. I went to the <laughs> marketing department. I said, I'm going to go to Texas. and interview for this job. I have no idea really what the job is about. You know, give me some magazines so that I can read them on my flight down there and I can try to sound halfway intelligent by the time I land there. And I did and, you know, I got the job and about two weeks later I moved to Arlington and I started driving around these five states uh, selling ESPN to cable operators, much like we're now doing the loss. We're, well, nothing ever changes. I'm still doing that now. We're trying to sell the Longhorn Network to Time Warner Cable. Uh, it's the same thing I was doing 30, uh, nearly 30 years ago when I was down here. But uh, anyway, that was that was uh, partially how I got how I got started here. Excellent. Who do you admire? Um, well, first and foremost, I admire my mother and father. And I learned uh, really everything that I needed to know to succeed from them. Um, neither one of them graduated from high school. Uh, but they had a great work ethic, and they, you know, they, they believed in supporting the family. Uh, family comes first, which is something I talk about all the time at ESPN. I mean, we're a hard-working company. People ask us all the time, you know, how is ESPN so successful? What did you do? What, what, how does it work? Well, we outwork a lot of people. We outwork a lot of our competitors. 
And the people at ESPN are the hardest working, most passionate people that I've ever been around. Um, but I always say to them, you know, the key to success at ESPN is not to be a workaholic. You know, we're looking for people who have a good balance in their lives and that they put their families first. Family comes first. We want ESPN to be a close second, don't get me wrong. <laughs> But we never want them to confuse their priorities of keeping their families first. And that means getting to your kids' outings and doing the things with your families that you need to do to be a good parent. And I learned all that from my folks, so that's really who I admire most. What are, what are some things that you hope to master that you might not have mastered yet? You have a, a list of things that, geez, I'd like to be better at that. Golf. Yeah, yeah. Uh, not for lack of trying, but uh, <laughs> um, what do I want? Uh, you know, I don't really know. I'm not sure I, I have a, a thoughtful answer for you for that question. Uh, I just I love what I do here at ESPN. We have a great company. Um, you know, I believe. You know, Delos referred to it earlier. I believe in the people of ESPN. I believe my job is to support our people. I don't think I have all the answers. I don't pretend to be a technologist. I don't. You know, I, I try to support the people of ESPN who know what the mission of the company is to serve sports fans. Uh, they know their passion about what they do, and we, we do our best to support them and tell them that, you know, as long as you act with integrity, we'll give you a lot of rope at our company. You can make a mistake at our company, provided it's an honest mistake. These are the kind of things we talk to our people about, mm -hmm. and that's what I just get, you know, I, I just enjoy that aspect of, yeah. of the work. So. Uh, Perhaps you never get all that mastered, so maybe that's my, my best answer. So maybe we'll flip that around. You mentioned mistakes. Do you think about if you were to offer an example of a mistake you made that you look back and say, geez, that's one I wouldn't want to do again that you could share? Yeah, I mean, I mean, I have no problem sharing them. I don't, it's funny, I don't often, I, I guess they're mistakes because they were businesses that didn't work, but we, I certainly don't view them as negatives. Mistakes have such a negative connotation, but we launched retail stores, you know, where you could come and buy thing, you know, 50,000 things with ESPN's logo on it, that tanked. <clears throat> we launched a phone uh, probably before its time, launched it in the Super Bowl, we were so excited about it, that tanked. So we've got plenty of business examples that, that don't work, but I don't look at them at all negatively. Mm -hmm. I look at them positively. If you're running a successful organization, like ESPN or the University of Texas, and you're not trying new things, you're not trying hard enough. And guess what? Not everything is going to work. So I wouldn't at all be daunted about trying new things, whether it's in your personal career, your student life, your careers as you get going. You've got to try new things all the time, and not all of them are going to work. As long as you did them with integrity and honesty and you did your best, there's no shame in any of that. You just move on. Next. I mean, that's, we, don't, we don't sit around and dwell on any mistakes we make uh, very long. Right. It's like a ball player who only hits one out of three times. Wouldn't be a bad place to be. No. Right. So what would you, what's, what's the, if you think about a highlight other than the Longhorn Network, obviously, <laughs> what, would you, what would you say your, the, the, your greatest accomplishment is to date? Um, professionally? You know, I don't really, um, I don't have a single thing. Or, may, or maybe favorite one, if there's one. Yeah, I mean, I, I don't really have a single thing. I just, I, I like, my, the favorite thing that I like to see is uh, when I see the ESPN people working together or working well with other companies. Um, to me, that's where I get the most enjoyment out of my job. And I'm proud of that because I think our culture uh, supports that. You know, our culture supports people who are good people to work with, who are hardworking, who are passionate, who have integrity. And so if, if, if that's the, you know, I believe that's the culture of the company and that's what I'm most proud of, of having done whatever part I've contributed to instilling that at ESPN. That, that's what I'm most proud of. What, where do you see ESPN five years, 10 years, if you were to, to think about it 50 years from now? Well, um, I hope to be thinking of it from a beach by then, but yeah. <laughs> uh, um, uh, let me know how it goes. So you, guys, you guys will be running the company by then. But, uh, um, you know, I, I see us continuing to expand. We're, we're, uh, our company has literally never stopped growing. We have a very clear mission, and that's to serve sports fans. Uh, you know, 90% of Americans consider themselves sports fans. It's a huge market. You see the passion for your own 
sports down here. I mean, at UT and Texas overall, it's a hotbed. So I think we can continue to find new ways to serve fans. So I think our company can continue to grow. We're in a couple of hundred countries around the world. We've got 17 different uh, versions of Sports Center around the world, numerous languages. There's, uh, there's five million mobile sets uh, out in the world, uh, 500 million, excuse me. Um, and uh, there's plenty of opportunity to continue to grow and serve sports fans. So I, I, I see us continuing to grow uh, is the answer to your question, Eric. Yeah. All right. You know, exactly how, I don't know. People always ask me, well, what do you see next? What, uh, what are you going to do next? And I give them my favorite answer, which is I don't know. I'm not a technologist, as I said. Um, what I do is have people, in the, people who work at ESPN that know the mission, are passionate about serving fans, and, and are, take pride in the ESPN company continuing to grow. So I expect them to come to me to say, we've got to do this next. We've got to launch high definition. We've got to launch 3D. We should do business with the University of Texas and launch the Longhorn Network. All of these things come up from our, our people, and our management supports our people. That's, that's how we try to operate the company. We empower people. I do not believe that, and I tell people all the time, do not wait uh, for all the answers to come in a memo from the corner office. Because you know what? They aren't coming. You have, you can, you know, ideas don't come just from people with titles or corner offices. They come from people. Any location, any position, any time. And if you keep your ears open, you can learn a lot by listening to your people. Do you see a role for corporate social responsibility at ESPN and, and more broadly in, in business in general? Yes, we're very committed to that at ESPN. We have a whole group team ESPN headed up by a 32-year veteran at the company, Rosa Gaddy, uh, who runs that. We're very committed to giving back to the communities. Uh, we're very fortunate to be you know, in the position we're in as a company and as citizens of this great country. So we feel very strongly about giving back. We founded a uh, the V Foundation for Cancer Research in 1993 with Jim Valvano, the late North Carolina State basketball coach who was working for us when he came down with cancer. We've raised $110 million since 1993 uh, for cancer research. Um, we are doing things with the Boys and Girls Clubs, uh, shelters, veterans groups. Uh, our employees love to give back, and so as a management team, we're facilitating that as fast as we can. And it's been a big positive for the company, but I think corporations do have a responsibility myself. Do, do you see a role for ESPN as, as really a powerful, powerful voice and an influencer to, to have an impact on the role of, say, women in sports or race in sports or violence? In, we've had a number of deaths in, in pro hockey this year that people are talking now about violence in sport and the, the potential repercussions. Yes, we certainly have a voice, and we provide all kinds of platforms, uh, whether it be on television, dot-com, digital businesses, radio, print, and the magazine. We have a, a lot of platforms, so we certainly do bear a responsibility to be a, a place where those conversations can take mm -hmm. place, and that's a large part of what, of what we do. If you look at all the hours that there aren't games on the air, there's studio programming where hopefully we have thoughtful conversation about all of those issues that are that are taking place. Mm -hmm. All right. You're going to manage someone. You manage lots of people. What makes what makes some of them stand out from others? You've talked a lot about culture. What would make someone really stand out in in your mind? Uh, you know, I like I was taught. I had a lot of mentors along the way, and one of them told me to be a student of the business. And I never it actually makes sense being at a university talking about being a student of the business. I just always love the expression. I mean, you never stop learning. I don't care how long you've been in a job or, or how much you think you have it mastered or not. You should never stop learning. So I look for people who are always trying to learn new things and, and apply it to what we're doing. We can do, you, know, we can, you can always do things better. So I look for people who, who are trying to be better. They're students of the business. Passion integrity, detail-oriented, optimism, and being positive person. We don't, I don't, I can't stand to be around a bunch of negativity. So I look for all those kind of attributes in right. people. What surprised you when, you when you found yourself 
in the top job, people say, well, it's lonely there. Or, you know, they, what surprises did you have when you, when you took on that role? Um, well, I think the biggest thing is that it's hard to turn it off because you've, you're responsible for everything. And I, I, don't, I take that responsibility seriously, so it's, it's hard to you know, kind of check out. So it's yeah. a, there's a large volume, I guess, is the biggest. Maybe I shouldn't have been surprised, but since I mm -hmm. never did it before, I was. And uh, <laughs> uh, it was, you know, it's just a large volume. And you have to be able to manage that and still keep your family straight and stay healthy and exercise. It's hard to balance it all. So how do you do that? How do you, and you talked, you've talked a lot about balance and you want your employees to be balanced. And you've got challenges and those challenges multiply as one moves up the organization. How do you... How do, you, how do you turn it off? When do you turn it off? And what tips might you provide for folks to, you to know, navigate? I don't think it's that complicated. You've got to discipline yourself. You have to make time for what's most important, whether it's your family or exercise or vacation time. Again, we're not looking for workaholics at ESPN. I don't, it's not healthy and it's not a road to success, I don't believe. So uh, I just say you have to be disciplined. But boy, if you have a, a lot of responsibility, Sometimes you can't control that, and you have to do what you have to do, and then, then get back on track. But uh, you know, I find myself getting up a lot earlier in the morning uh, now than I used to, and I find that's like my most productive uh, time to work. So, what time do you get up in the morning? Usually, this might be a shocker to some yeah. some in the audience. I, I'm I'm usually out of bed by five. All right, which is not unusual for a person in your role, right? So, so those eight o'clock classes are sounding pretty good now. Is what, I'm, is what I'm thinking. So let me ask you this. And we're going to go to, to, to questions from the students right after this. Right? So this, this may or may not be a segue in. But let's suppose there was, in your business, you had contracts to broadcast all kinds of football games in, say, college sport. And let's suppose that all of a sudden, con you know, conferences realigned. <laughs> Just wondering. Um, what might that do? You know, how, how would that affect you? What, how would one navigate th that? When, when are we going to this. the students' questions? <laughs> yeah. Well, I'm just telling you, you it's know, about to happen. You so know, <laughs> I'm warming you, know, you up. I don't know. I mean, you know, I mean, all kidding aside, it's a, it's, it's a, it's a difficult and speculative question. Mm -hmm. We have deals to televise virtually every conference in the United States um, across all sports. So... You know, in some respects, we'll have to adapt to what the colleges and universities, you know, determine to be the form that they wish to organize themselves in. We do not control that. That is up to the universities. Mm -hmm. So, in some respects, you know, I will, we will deal with that. We will deal with the, the deck of cards that ends up getting played as it gets played. Um, mm -hmm. And I suspect we'll be fine. The schools will still continue to play themselves, uh, other schools and athletic events, and, mm -hmm. you know, the shuffling. Uh, Will 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 pass. I mean, I think I think stability is something we all are looking for uh, right now, and I'm I'm hoping we get there. All right. We'll 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 be able to deal with it. All right. Well, let's go to the questions, and we've got mics down each side here. So if whoever is uh, most tempted to ask a question. Good evening, guys. Hi, my name is John Connell, and I was just uh, had a question for you here, George. Um, is it too early at this point in time to say whether or not the Longhorn Network is considered a success? And if it is considered a success, do you see it being replicated elsewhere? Well, John, that's an excellent question. Uh, I consider it to be a great success right off the bat. I mean, you haven't, uh, until you've launched a business, or in this case a television network, in you know, six to nine months, you, you have no idea the amount of work that goes into it. I can't tell you how proud I am of the staff we have, as I said, it numbers about 75 who came down here and put this together in such a short period of time. And for those of you who've had the chance to see the network, it looks absolutely first class and fantastic. So from that standpoint, I'm very happy with it. And I think we're off to a great start. Um, obviously, we've got some work to do on the distribution side of the business. So as the loss mentioned, please let your uh, providers know, whether it's Time Warner or whomever, because they listen to you as the, as the customer, and we need to get those deals done. And then lastly, uh, you know, I'm very excited about the Longhorn Network. We have never worked on a network with a major university, a world-class university like you all have here. And I think this is going to continue to evolve. Over 10% of the 
uh, programming is going to be non-sports. I think it opens up great opportunity to explore your fabulous mm -hmm. university, the culture of Austin, and all things that are great about, about UT. So I'm very excited about it. But my point is I think it's going to grow and evolve, and it'll be, it will be a great success. But I'm very happy with where it is already. I hear you loud and clear on that one. Thank you. I appreciate it. You're welcome. I think I forgot your second question, but as long as you're satisfied, I'm satisfied. <laughs> Bravo, my friend. <laughs> Hi, my name's Mark, and I just had a question. How do you guys view the coverage of ESPN by outside entities, either through you know, the book that was written or Deadspin coming in and covering your different policies? How, does that, how, do you guys, how do you guys respond to that and deal with it? You know, we deal with it in a straightforward manner as we can. I mean, these things didn't, the, the blogs didn't exist, you know, several years ago. Now we've got blogs, you know, dedicated to commenting on every single thing we do, whether it's with sarcasm or trying to do with it in a, doing it in a straightforward manner. So we're in a, under a bit of a microscope, but we don't have anything to hide. We try to be transparent in what we do with our policies, how we deal with our people. We, we've got problems like every other company. We deal with them in a straightforward manner. And if a blog wants to write about it and criticize us, you know, I, I suppose that's their right to do it. But, you know, again, it goes back to we operate our company with integrity and, and we try to do the right thing. And you know, after that, I'll let the chips fall where they may. Um, my question is, how did you all decide on uh, the University of Texas to um, launch such a, you know, huge network for instead of any other school in the country? Were there any other schools uh, considered? There is no other school in the country that we would rather be doing this with than the University of Texas. And I don't think we had any other opportunities. But uh, no, I mean, all kidding aside, I mean, it was an opportunity that was presented to us. Uh, the University of Texas is in a unique position with all that you have going on here. And for a company that's in our, in our business of serving sports fans, and the long-term view we take on our business uh, it was an absolute no-brainer to decide to work something out with your, you know, with your university and move forward here. It's an exciting uh, project, and uh, I don't know if it'll be replicated elsewhere. If it is, we'll take a look at it. But right now, we're focused solely on the Longhorn Network. Thank you. My name is Patrick uh, McGregor. I'm a track athlete here at the University of Texas, and my question is, if you were not CEO, uh, what job would you like to have at ESPN and why? My goal is to return to the mail room. <laughs> so I, I, I won't have to get up as early unless the shift starts at 6 in the morning. Um, I don't know. I, I, uh, there's a lot of jobs at ESPN that, uh, that, that would be great. Uh, we have our head of communications, Chris LaPlaca, here. Uh, Head of our worldwide facilities, Ed Durso is here. These these guys all have extremely challenging jobs. Uh, Arne Reese is with us here. He's business development on a global basis for us. I mean, we have plenty of jobs at ESPN that let are me, exciting. Let me rephrase that. What's the most fun job at ESPN? What would you think is the coolest job that someone could have? The coolest job at, you could have at ESPN. I don't know, maybe a stage manager. You get to you know, talk with the talent all the time during commercial breaks. It's a fun job. A lot of, a lot of folks enjoy that. Thank you. <laughs> Hello, thanks for coming. Uh, I believe the largest uh, or the biggest growing spectator sport is mixed martial arts. Uh, Zufa and the UFC have signed a seven-year deal with Fox to broadcast events and whatnot. I'm a big fan. I barely see any... Uh, facts or statistics or highlights on ESPN. Do you all have any intentions of more significantly integrating any of that uh, martial arts stuff into your programming? We'll have to see. I mean, we're kind of firmly on the fence uh, regarding <laughs> mixed martial arts. Um, we do some programs. Uh, we cover it on Sports Center. We cover it in the magazine. We haven't done the big deal like they just did with, with, with Fox, but I would say that was as much a matter of economics as anything else. So. We'll see. It's a long road. I know the sport is popular, and, and you know, we'll continue to find ways to serve you as the fan. Hi, I'm Helen Tao. Um, my question is, I guess being like sports fans and in business, we're really competitive. So how do you know what job to take and what job to turn down in your like success to being president? 
Well, uh, I don't think you have that many opportunities to be turning things down. Um, <laughs> I don't think I did. I mean, once you kind of start on a track, I, as I said, I came down here to Texas and started in the sales department. So for the next 15 years, if I wanted to stay in sales, which I did, it was pretty easy to know what the next line of succession was. So, um, but I think to answer your question, you'll know it in your gut. And uh, I would pay a lot of attention to what you're doing and who you're going to be working for. All right, thank you. Hello, my name is Austin Jorn, and uh, I was wondering how much is ESPN looking into sustainable practices for a future? Quite a bit. Uh, we have a t we have we have teams of people now that travel around uh, to all of our events and and work on our sustainability and how much we're accomplishing on each of those each of those events. Uh, We'll have a crew at every college game day this year working on sustainability at the X Games, at the ESPYs. We're, 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 we're making good headway there. Our buildings are now at the, I don't know the exact vernacular, but at the, at the highest codes for environmental impact on some of the new buildings we've built. So we're, we're very focused on it. Thank you. It's important. Hi, my name is uh, Daniel. Uh, you said you've been at ESPN 30 years. How did the creation of all the regional sports networks affect your business model? Uh, you know, that's a good question, Daniel. I would say, you know, they haven't really affected our business model very much. I mean, they've made us, you know, it's, it's more competition. We operate in a very competitive uh, sports television world, so that makes us, makes us better. I mean, we're competing with all the regionals every night, and um, and we're very focused on that, but we don't, it, it hasn't really affected our kind of national business very much, in my opinion. Thank you very much. I have a brother uh, graduating North Texas soon. He'll be going into sports broadcasting. What uh, advice can you give him for getting to that business, maybe even ESPN? <laughs> even better, can you get him a job? <laughs> well, first of all, I would encourage him because it's a great business, it's filled with great people, and it's continuing to grow. So I would tell your brother that uh, just start knocking on doors and uh, learn as much as he can, follow up with, he can, with, with everybody that he can, and just network. But he'll get into the business. It's, it's, a, it's a big and growing business, and it's a, it is a fun place to work. Thank you. Uh, hello, Mr. Bodenheimer. My name is Anthony Chin. And I would just wanted to uh, ask you if you could talk more about what you did as a salesman and more directly how what you did as a salesman led you to the place that you are today. What I did as a salesman, I drove around, uh, as I said, the southwest part of the country for several years trying to make three calls a day, morning, lunch, and afternoon through every small town in those five states. And uh, I had to work hard. I had to realize who I was calling on what I was saying to them. I tried to learn something about their business. I had to keep all the schedules myself. Uh, I didn't need hotel reservations in a lot of the towns that I was working in. You just kind of pulled in. And it was a pretty small town. But, uh, you know, whether you're calling on uh, mom and pop who are ro running their own cable system or you're calling on the CEO of a company, I don't think dealing with people changes much. You know, you've got to be prepared. You've got to know what you're talking about. You have to give them a compelling reason to want to work with you, and then you have to follow up. And I'd say I learned that lesson very well, calling on, you know, 10 to 15 different people a week and having to follow up with them. It was, it was, a, it was a big workload, but uh, I'd say that's where I learned whatever it is I have learned about dealing with people. Thank you. Thank you. Um, from the ancient days, in 1980 and now in 2011, <laughs> technology has clearly advanced a lot. How would you say the role of technology has in your company's um, priorities? Well, it's amazing. I mean, it's everything's changed. Uh, you know, we used to sit around and w watch Sports Center in our world at 6:30, and that was kind of your first time in the day to collect the sports news if that's what you were interested in. Now. You know, with all the digital technology and Twitter and Facebook and everything we're, we all have today, news is instantaneous, and sports news is no different. And, and look at ESPN. I mean, news breaks on our air all day. So uh, it's, it's, it's forced us to, if we're going to serve fans, we've we got to be in the game. And so we've got tremendous amounts of resources and assets. Uh, 
people all over the country collecting news, feeding it in, uh, distributing it on our media. I mean, it's, it, the whole game is different from the, uh, the ancient days. Thank you. Hi, Mr. Bodenheimer. You uh, talked about how proud you are of the culture you instilled at ESPN, how you like to see them working together and with other companies. And um, I was just wondering, um, what is your relationship like with Dan Patrick? And uh, uh, is that more out of him working with ESPN employees, more out of um, a competition with Scott Van Pelt Show, Mike and Mike, and whatnot? Or did something happen with his leaving ESPN? Well, first off, I don't think I said I instilled the culture. I said the culture that has been instilled. I don't take personal credit for that. I'm um, sure you had a, you, you were a great, uh, you were instrumental in bringing that. Well, thank you. Um, <laughs> you welcome. said it, though I did. You're welcome. <laughs> uh, you know, uh, we had a wonderful time with Dan. Uh, Dan was a big part of ESPN's growth, did the big show with, with Keith back in the old days, and uh, was, was a wonderful employee for us for a lot of years. I mean, you know, people move on in their careers, and it was, you know, Dan felt it was time uh, for him to move on and wished him nothing but success. And, uh, but he, he holds a big place in, in ESPN's uh, history, and he's a, he's a wonderful, uh, wonderful uh, person and, and talent. Thank you. Hey, Mr. Bodenheimer, how are you? Thanks for coming. Um, with the NFL season starting tonight, who do you favor to win the Super Bowl and why? <laughs> and you can be honest, you won't hurt my feelings. Well, yeah, I, 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 see your, uh, I see your allegiances there. Um, gee, I think the Packers are going to win. Uh, you know. You know, I, you, got, you have to watch ESPN. We got, if we have, if, if you want to see 30, if you want to see 30 opinions on who's going to win the Super Bowl, uh, you know, check us out. But the, probably the Giants. Oh, all right. Thanks a lot. <laughs> I just had to answer the question. It was an interesting question. <laughs> Good evening, Mr. Bordenheimer. My name is Arman, and I just moved from India to Texas a couple of years ago. I wanted to know uh, the key from uh, just being in the U.S. to diversifying to become a global brand? The key to becoming a global brand? Mm -hmm. Well, for us, it was A, getting out there, and B, you asked earlier about mistakes we made. We first thought the idea of an international network was to export product from the United States to India, Europe, Latin America. That's wrong. That was wrong for us. Uh, the, you know, the Fans in India wanted to see things that they were interested in, not what we thought they were interested in from the U.S. So we had to flip our business model, and in India's case, you know, buy every single piece of cricket that we could possibly get our right, hands on. Right. Um, but it took us, you know, probably longer than I'd like to admit to learn that lesson. But that's how you get your brand. You got to get out there, and then you got to deliver a product that the local fans want. We've made tremendous inroads in in India in particular, and I'm I'm proud of what we we've, we've built over there. It's uh, uh, it's doing quite well. Thank you. Do you see knowledge that you've picked up in South Asia, cricket in particular, coming here? Do I see knowledge? Your knowledge of cricket coming here. Do we, oh, yes. Are we going to see more cricket? We see a lot more soccer than we once did. Yes, you will see. You're going to see more sports that aren't traditional U.S. stronghold sports being televised here. A, because we have the mediums to do it with our broadband service, ESPN3, for example. But also because, of course, the demographics of our country are changing here, and the barriers to entry are so low. We can we can serve cricket fans to cricket here in the U.S. And we will. We'll, you'll see us continue to move in that direction. It should be fun. Uh, hi, my name's Henry, and that was pretty much one of my questions, so thank you for answering that. And as a soccer fan, thank you for paying more attention towards that, especially with the World Cup and the national team. But um, my other question is, why does it feel like the winners of the ESPYs are announced before the broadcast of the ESPYs? Why does it feel like they are? Uh, I don't know. Um, uh, perhaps you know more than I do, Henry. Um, uh, <laughs> Because to my knowledge, they're all announced at the show. There might actually we we can't put all of them on the stage on one night, so some of them are done the day before, just to save time on the day of the show, which perhaps is what you're referring to. But beyond that, I, you got me on that one. Thanks. 
But I'll remember, Henry. Don't worry. <laughs> uh, so I know that ESPN is a sports uh, station, but it's also a news organization. I think it's the place that a lot of most of us go to for sports news. And you talked a little bit about uh, corporate social responsibility earlier. And I just wanted to ask you about the responsibility of a news organization, uh, about things such as presenting news in an unbiased manner and perhaps not sensationalizing news for uh, better ratings. Well, we, I couldn't agree with you more. And we, we, we operate at the highest you know, journalistic standards we possibly can. Our, our editorial folks, writers, reporters, operate completely independently of management. Uh, they're, they're there to report the news. And we've been operating in that manner for 32 years now. And uh, I can tell you by the amount of calls that I get from the commissioners and the various folks at the leagues, uh, we must be doing something right because they don't like everything they hear on our air. And that's when we're reporting the news. But that's, you know, that's what we do. I give them the same answer every time I get one of those calls. You know, you know, did we get our facts right and did we give you an opportunity to comment? And as long as both of those, as long as the answers of both of those are yes, I think we've done our job. Not always are, and then we go back and fix it. Thank you. Hi, Mr. Botenheimer. Um, my name is Sean. Um, I was wondering if you could speak about the relationship between ESPN Sports and ABC Sports, and how your roles um, within the two organizations uh, differ. They really don't differ. It's a great question. Uh, we, we've been, we're fortunate at the Walt Disney Company to have two great brands and, and businesses, ABC Sports and ESPN, under the same umbrella. Um, but I don't know, eight years ago maybe when we merged them um, and I was named president of ABC Sports, we, mer we essentially merged the two. So we have singular staffs now that produce the, the bulk of what we do together. So there's, there's very little uh, distinction from a management standpoint. Um, we also made a decision that we really, our bread was going to be buttered mostly with the ESPN brand. And that's when we put, uh, that's when we started to brand everything on ABC, ESPN on ABC. And that's been a big winner, uh, not only for our company, but for um, our affiliates and advertisers. They want to be associated with ESPN, and this was a way to expand the ESPN brand to uh, broadcast television. But uh, that's, how we're, that's how we're operating the companies today. Hey, I was curious, what provisions are in place, if any, for the Longhorn Network to react to the future of college athletics, or more specifically, how can it respond to the in the face of conference realignment as far as folding into a regional network or partnering with another school, if need be? Well, it's like any business. Uh, you know, you have to act in your best interest and deal with the circumstances that you have. That's no different for a university or a business or a, or a, or a television network. So, you know, we don't have a set of criteria. If this happens, we're going to do this. We'll deal with it when we see the landscape of what we're dealing with. Uh, my, our intention is to operate the Longhorn Network just as it's operating today as a, a wonderful standalone uh, network devoted you know, to this great university and distributed nationally. I mean, that's our goal. And uh, I have learned over the years there's no such thing as an overnight success. Uh, people often think these businesses pop up overnight and you, know, you read about things. But if you, if you often get behind the headlines of most major businesses, you see the entrepreneur, the people, they've been at it six, seven, eight, ten years. There's no overnight successes in my, in my point of view, or very few. And I don't think the Longhorn Network will be any different. It's going to take us time to, to fulfill the vision we have for what it is, get it distributed, and make it a great product. And that's what we're aiming to do. We've got time for one last question. Yes, you got it. Yes. Uh, hi, I'm Keith. Um, so as president of ESPN, um, do you have a fantasy football team? I do. <laughs> that was the question? That, yeah. Okay, I was, well, I, good. That's, that, 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 I can handle that one. All right. Uh, uh, also, she would like to ask, um, who's your favorite <laughs> oh. player? Your favorite athlete. Oh, uh, my favorite athlete. Uh, 
Arnold Palmer. But George, there's, there's, a, there's a couple of traditions that are about to happen to you here. But before you do that, you, you've, you've shared a tremendous amount with us. And, and as I recap some of the things that, that I think are, are powerful messages, it's about get up early. It's going to be easier to do that if you really love what, you, what you're doing. Watch out for other people. Be passionate. Find balance. And do it with integrity. And I think that's a message that, that's a powerful message that, that all leaders, I think truly successful leaders, probably need to, need to exude. So thanks for sharing that with us today. Thank you. Thank you for having me here today. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dean Hurst, Mr. Bodenheimer, and DeLos Dodd. Thank you very much for coming tonight. I know that we will be able to take your lessons and apply them to our own lives. As a token of our appreciation, the Undergraduate Business Council would like to present Mr. Bodenheimer with his personalized Stetson cowboy hat in recognition of your participation in the VIP Distinguished Speaker Series. Thank you. Oh, boy. Man, I, I can honestly say I don't have one of these. <laughs> All right, how's it oh, going? Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Also, we'd like to thank the Undergraduate Business Council, Office of Student Life, and ESPN team for helping us put on this event. Our next VIP speaker will be Brian Gallagher, the president and CEO of United Way on September 20th. Then we will be joined by CEO of Southwest Airlines, Gary Kelly, on October 27th. All this information can be found at the TexasBusinessCouncil.com website and McCombs website. Thank you very much.